evening, ladies and gentlemen. Please forgive this pastor for not having his PowerPoint ready tonight. Bad boy. Bad boy. Welcome to Regeneration Life Church Online Thursday night. Detailed verse-by-verse verse study through the book of Jude. Tonight, what are we fighting for? We're told to contend for the faith. Jude 3 says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Contend, fight, struggle, wrestle, do battle with, strenuous. But exactly what are we fighting for? What exactly is this faith? And it goes beyond what you might think. And yet, it's as simple as what you might think at the same time. There was a poisonous plant in ancient Judea called the Darnell, which is also called Zizanian. It resembled wheat in every single way to the point at which even an expert could not tell the difference while it was growing. From seed to growth, it looked exactly the same as wheat, but it was poison. Mixing this Darnell, this Zizanian flour, with wheat flour causes the following symptoms. Dizziness, intoxication, hindered thinking, inability to walk, paralysis, hindered speech. Well, I have that one sometimes, and I've never taken this before. And finally, even death. The Darnell or Zizanian plant is often called, goes by this name, false wheat. Just like you have gold, you have fool's gold. It looks like gold it, in every single way. It shines like gold, it, but it's not gold. This looks like wheat, but it's not wheat. What's worse is the, if it gets root, its roots can actually uproot wheat itself. Jesus spoke of this kind of plant in Matthew 13, 24 through 30. <clears throat> Another parable. Put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. Those tares? That's your Darnell plant. That's your Zizanian. So tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. These tares are unbelievers that have been planted in the church. And in the book of Jude, we run into these people a lot. The entire book almost is focused on this. These folks got religion. They added Jesus to their lives as maybe fire insurance so that they could continue living the way they wanted to, but they think, oh, well, I go to church on Sunday, so I'm okay with God, even though I'm doing all these things that God said not to do, right? So they're not spiritually resurrected on the inside. They just got religion. So they're lost and unchanged. They have profession without possession. They're pretenders. Some may even be self-deceived into thinking they are saved as evidenced by Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23. Look at God. Look at all these great things we did. What are you talking about? How, do you, how are you saying that? I never knew you. We also have these poisonous tares even on our pulpits. They hinder the church. They paralyze the church. Especially if they're in positions of authority. They get in the way of the church's mission to save souls. They can even uproot the church 
and they assist the devil in removing good seed from off the ground of those who might otherwise be saved. These are the false wheat who uproot the truth. Jesus described them as tares. Tares, again, are poisonous plants that have been planted among the good wheat. Now, what would you do if you had a friend? You love this person. You've known them your entire life. Or a family member. What would you do if they were about to drink poison? This poison would make them sick or kill them. And they're about to drink it. Wouldn't you do everything you could to prevent that? What if they already ate it or drank it? Wouldn't you do everything you could at that point to save their lives or at the very least keep them from getting sick? If it doesn't kill them, makes them sick, don't, don't you want to do everything you can to stop that person from getting sick? That's why we don't take people to restaurants that have just had cases of food poisoning. Yet we'll take people to churches that have spiritual food poisoning. False doctrine has been sending souls to hell for centuries. And I'm not talking about where we might disagree on the timing of the rapture. Or we might disagree on whether tongues are for today or done away. We're not talking about any of that stuff. That we can debate. Um, we can talk. We can lovingly, we shouldn't be yelling at each other and calling each other reprobates, not for stuff like that, okay? Those are, those are issues we can talk, we can talk about on the side. I'm talking about false doctrine. I'm talking about dangerous stuff that can uproot the faith of people who are just coming to Christ or who would come to Christ if they heard the correct message and not a lying one. In the context of this epistle, Jude, what it means to earnestly contend for the faith is to try to keep the poison out of our churches. Charles Spurgeon said this, and I quote, The great business of the saints is to defend, if necessary, with their lives, the faith once delivered to them. We are to, we, we are to put trust with the gospel. We are the trustees of a divine deposit of invaluable truth. And we must be true to our truth at all costs. And let me go back. I, I said we are to put, I misread. We are to uh, put trust in the gospel. It actually says we are put in trust with the gospel. If we're trusted with this, then we need not to take it, to, to, to play with it, to change it, to make it more palatable. To, we are trusted with this message. We are to give it the way God wants it given. John Maxwell said this, When leaders refuse to confront wrongs, the atmosphere can become lethargic and unfocused. When leaders don't stand for something, they're people fall for anything. Folks, we're fighting for the faith. What does it mean? Well, the faith, definite article, the faith, we find in the Bible that faith and belief are synonymous. They both are translations of the Greek word pistis. Deeply held beliefs that guide your behavior. If it doesn't guide your behavior, it's not a belief according to the Greek word. The saints, folks, are not people who become thus after they die and are declared such. The saints are born again people of God. Philippians 4, 21 and other scriptures show this. We're going to get into that next week when we discuss who are the saints. Oh, there's some great stuff next week. There's some great stuff this week. The faith is the only way. This is why we're fighting so hard for it. It is the only way men's souls are saved. God's grace is received through true faith. Ephesians 2, 8, by grace are ye saved through faith. 
This faith is in Christ's sacrifice. Romans 3.25, whom God has sent forth to be a propitiation. That means a substitute. Through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. You know what a forbearance is? Let's say you have you owe something to the court. Okay? And maybe you're in contempt of court and they fine you two hundred dollars. A forbearance means they're not going to make you pay it. Why? Why do we have this in our souls? Because of the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ, because he paid it. Hebrews 12.2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. This faith is finished. He is the author of it. He is the finisher of it. And it is through this faith that men's souls get saved. It is through this faith that the forbearance of God is applied to our credit because we owed him a sin debt that we could not pay. And because of Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, God forbears that on our behalf. Folks, Galatians 3.26 shows, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. The faith, this faith, the faith, is how you become a child of the Most High God. We were children of the devil. We were children of wrath. We were children of disobedience, Ephesians 2. We were children of the devil in our natural state. All of us. You, me, your parents, your grandparents, my parents, my grandparents, your best friends, doesn't matter. Because we are all born in Adam. But through Christ, we can become the children of God. First of all, because of the born again experience. Because then inside you, you are made righteous and truly holy in your inner man. It's called the new man. It's called the new nature. It's called the regeneration, the spiritual resurrection. And then we have to live that out in our mm -hmm. flesh. And we have to follow holiness in the flesh. But we have already been made children of God in our spirits. By faith in Christ Jesus. At no point in time did I say that you were made sinlessly perfect. Let's make that clear. You still have to deal with the flesh. Your flesh still has to live out your new nature. But that new nature, which is righteous and truly holy, is on your inner man. That's how you become a child of God. By Adhering to the faith which was bought by Jesus Christ. The faith is the basis upon which the church is established. Acts 16.5 And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. The faith which was once delivered, not a fake, watered down, trivialized faith. The faith is the foundation of the church. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says this, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ, Jesus Christ. He's the foundation. Faith in Him is where we find our foundation of the church. But many do not lay the foundation of what they call church on the truth of Christ, but try to build their own foundation on an idol they made in their hearts that they call Jesus. They, they want to water down Jesus. They want a Jesus that looks at your sin and says, Ah, it's all right. But that's not our Jesus. Our Jesus will forgive your sin, but he's not going to sweep it under the rug. And he's not going to, he's not going to, to, how do I put this? Because I don't, I don't want to commit a heresy. I don't want to commit a fallacy here. He doesn't sweep sin under the rug. We have, to, we have to, by his blood, apply that blood to our sin. Okay? And while that sin may not, if you are born again, that sin will not be held to your charge. But at the same time, for relationship's sake, Jesus told his own disciples that they should come to him and ask for forgiveness. As a matter of fact, 1 John says the same thing. Okay? 
Or some churches do this. They spend 40 minutes talking about whatever, sometimes not even referring to the gospel, and then give Jesus lip service at the end. Here are all the great things that's going to happen to you because of this, that, and the other thing, because you have faith, whatever they're defining faith as. So let's look at all these great things. And this is a great thing, and that's a great thing. And look, here's a water gun, and this and that and the other, and boom. And then Jesus only gets lip service at the end. Now, if you want to believe in Jesus, say this prayer. What's there for them to pray about at that point? Well, you haven't given them the gospel. The foundation of biblical teaching, guys. This is where a lot of people are going to say, oh, he's not. I'm going to give it to you, and I'm going to prove it to you. The foundation of biblical teaching has repentance and faith at its core. Hebrews 6.1 shows that the foundation of repentance, okay, it says, quote, the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Hello, somebody. Foundation of repentance. Now, I heard a Christian school administrator, former pastor, say that the Bible, the Bible never says repent of your sin. The guy clearly never read Hebrews 6, 1, which is sad because he teaches Bible at his Christian school. And he's telling everybody they don't have to repent. Yet, Hebrews 6.1 talks about repentance from dead works. I love somebody. Repentance, guys. And I've heard this so many times from so many pastors. And I'm sorry, it, it really it, it, it tears up my heart. They'll say, repentance is a work. Therefore, you don't have to repent to get saved. Really? Because repentance isn't something you do. Repentance is, is a choice that you make to change your mind. It is a change to your inner man. You go from believing one thing to believing another. That's repentance. That's not a work. You know what is a work? Having people repeat after you and telling them they're saved. That's a work. Hello, somebody? Now, you all have heard me. If you've heard me preach before, you know I have no problem with the concept of the sinner's prayer. But it is supposed to be a reflection of something that has already happened inside of you. Repentance isn't a work, guys. It's a change of mind that takes place because of godly sorrow. The sorrow for what sin did to our Jesus. Because without sin, he would not have had to go to the cross. You see what sin has done. You feel sorry. Godly sorrow. For what sin has done to Jesus. And you don't want to do it anymore. That's repentance. Don't tell me that's a work. And what does that change of mind entail? According to Hebrews 6.1. A turning from dead works. No, the Bible doesn't have the exact words. Repent of your sin. Or repent from your sin. You will not find those exact words. You also don't find words like trinity. And yet the truth is in there. Turning from dead works. From disobedience to the works that are of faith. Turning from dead works to serve the living God. Okay? The dead works. And we're talking about uh, these dead works go any, any, it's anything that you do that is not according to the will of God. It doesn't necessarily mean that you've gone out and done something bad and, and your, your will is all in it and let's go do it. It can be as simple as, you know, you know God wants you to do something and you flat, flat out just don't do it. That's sin. Whatsoever is not a faith is sin. Folks, come on now. Whatsoever is not a faith is sin. If you don't do it in faith, it's sin. So from the disobedience of sin to the works of religion, that's those are dead works. Yet far too many guys, far too many are misdefining repentance and they say it isn't required for salvation. I'm going to prove to you that it is. Okay? How can you turn to Jesus if you don't turn from sin? They're opposed to each other. Listen, repentance leads to salvation. You see that in 2 Corinthians 7.10. Repentance leads to eternal life. You see that in Acts 11.18. Repentance is set in opposition to perishing. You see that in 2 Peter 3.9.
Repentance leads to the acknowledging of the truth. 2 Timothy 2, 25. Jesus said he came to call sinners to repentance. Luke 5, 30-32. Jesus said to preach repentance. Luke 24, 47. And there's a party in heaven when a sinner repents. Luke 15, 7. That's a soul that's not going to hell now that's not going to heaven. Why is there a party in heaven over repentance if repentance isn't important? Why are we told to preach repentance if repentance isn't important? Why, did Je why does it say Jesus called sinners to repentance? Why does it say, well, uh, Jesus called sinners to say the sinner's prayer and go on and live like the dead? It's not right to tell people that repentance is not required for salvation. If you understood what repentance is, you would know it's not a work. It's a change of mind. God didn't talk so much about repentance in, under the old covenant to now tell you it doesn't matter in the new. God doesn't change. Repentance is foundational to faith. The argument can be made it's a component of faith. Listen, it is the proper foundation. We've been talking about foundations. It's the proper foundation that leads to saving souls. 1 Timothy 6.19 says, Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Folks. The faith is the basis for the very establishment of the church. And repentance alongside of it is also foundational. It's turning from dead works. Does that mean you, you're gonna, not going to mess up? No, it doesn't. It just means you're not going to live a lifestyle of unrepentant sin because you fear God. And by fear, I don't mean stark raving terror. I mean reverence. The faith once delivered unto the saints, folks, is not just a historical fact, but an expectation. We see in Acts 16.5 that churches are established in the faith, and that begs a few questions. I might get myself in trouble for asking these questions. If you feel like throwing your phone on the floor or your computer on the floor, remember, those break. Okay? But I'm going to ask these questions anyway. Considering that 1 Timothy 3.15 shows that the church of the living God is the pillar and ground of the truth, do places that do not tell you scriptural truth qualify as a church? Think about it. Number two, considering that 1 Timothy 3.9 speaks of holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. If these ministers in these churches play fast and loose with the words of God, is that place truly a church? Number three, considering that 1 Timothy 4, 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Can a place that teaches unscriptural error be scripturally called a church. And considering that 2 Peter 3.16 says, they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction, then are places where so-called ministers preach scriptures out of context to say something different than what God had intended to be said are those churches. Are they part of the church? I'm not going to answer that question. Those are questions that we need to think about. Listen, the faith is so vitally important, we cannot take it lightly. Hell is real. Hell is eternal. You cannot put can't put out the fires of hell with water. You can, listen, you can put out a fire on this earth with water. 
but you cannot defeat the fires of hell by watering down God's holy word. Listen, there are pastors I've talked with in the past that wish, I wish had gotten this message. Some pastors water down the word, and there are others who may not do it themselves, but they defend those who do. Well, you just need to understand, brother, at least they're not Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses, or they, they, don't, they don't go into Heresyville, and I'm sitting back there thinking they're watering down the gospel. They're watering down the word of God. They're, they're leading people astray just as much as anyone else does that, that, that denies the word of God or changes the message. They're doing the same thing. It doesn't matter if they call themselves Baptist or Pentecostal or whatever Christian denomination you want to throw on there. It doesn't matter what they call themselves. If they're watering down God's word, How are they defeating the fires of hell in the lives of, 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 of people who need Jesus? Well, you should. You should follow God. But if you don't, hey, don't worry about it. That's broad road nonsense. That is not narrow road truth. Once you are born again, God expects you to obey. I have said that many times, and I've given many scriptures showing this. In fact, we may do that tonight. Details now of the faith that was once delivered. First, the faith was provided for by Christ. Romans 3.25 shows it was provided for by His blood sacrifice, whom God hath set forth to be propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Remember what I said, forbearances. It means you owe a debt and you don't have to pay it anymore. Okay? All right. So, and by his resurrection, he also established the faith. Provided for us. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. Hello, somebody. Skip down to verse 17. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. So without the resurrection, there is no faith. And without the blood sacrifice, there is no faith. If your faith is a bloodless Jesus that, or, or a Jesus that's dead, that's not faith. Well, I, I, really, can't, I really can't abide by that uh, Blood sacrifice stuff that just that just that just sounds a little too barbaric for me, and, and I just you know, but I believe in the name, and I, no, no, guys, no, you need a you need a Jesus who offered himself on the cross and defeated death through resurrection. Because if you don't have a Savior who died and was resurrected, how do you know that he defeated death? Moving on, the faith is of the gospel, Philippians 1.27, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. I just gave you the gospel. So we're going to move on. Salvation, ladies and gentlemen, salvation from, from hell and being able to go to heaven when you die or when Jesus comes back to get you is by faith. Ephesians 2.8, For by grace ye are saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. 2 Timothy 3.15, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. It is by faith that you were saved. The faith is the life foundation of the just. I'll give you three scriptures. Romans 1.17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. There's your born again experience. There's your spiritual resurrection. The Holy Ghost lives inside. Jesus lives inside you through the agency of the Holy Ghost. Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me 
and gave himself for me. Romans 3.28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. We are justified by faith. Faith is the foundation of being justified. You want to know a basic definition of justification? Just as if I never sinned. Faith, the faith that we are fighting for, that we're contending for, is the faith that causes God to live inside you. We just touched on it. Let's touch on it some more. Galatians 3.14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That's Jew and Gentile. Notice, Paul includes himself. Paul's a Jew. Tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee of Pharisees. He says we, while he's talking about the Gentiles. He's talking about Jew and Gentile right there. Everybody. We might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. 1 John 3.24 And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. You're not saved by works, but once you are saved, you're born again, and God makes you want to work. Continuing with the verse, and hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. God lives inside the person with faith. Colossians 1.27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory of his mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Through faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside you. Jesus is in you by the agency of the Holy Spirit. You want to know how to please God? Faith pleases God. Hebrews 11, 16, or excuse me, 11, 6. Tripped over my brain again. Hebrews 11, 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. That means your works don't mean nothing. What is it in the Greek? Nothing. What is it in the South? Nothing. What is it in Texas? Nothing. Your works don't mean nothing. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently do what? Seek him! You need faith to please God. Nothing you do outside of that faith can please God. Now the just live by faith. If you are just, you are living by that faith that you have. By the power of the Holy Ghost. By the power of the Lord inside you. But without faith, nothing you do matters. You need faith in Christ. My next point, I just touched on it. Let me just go ahead and give you the scriptures because my next point, I just gave it without even looking. All right, the faith is not received by works, Romans 4, 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, that's Jesus, his faith is counted for righteousness. Galatians 2, 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. And not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. No religious works at all. You cannot. If you are not born again. If you are not spiritually resurrected. Even going to church is a sin. What? Yeah. Because it's not done in faith. Without faith it's impossible to please God. Anything that is not of faith is sin. If you're, if you're just going to church because you think, oh, you know what, I, I blew it this week, but, you know, I'll just go to church and God will wipe the slate clean. No. You know what wipes the slate clean, slate clean? A relationship with Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ. That's what wipes the slate clean. That's what we're fighting for. The faith that was once delivered to the saints. Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us 
by the washing of regeneration, hello, spiritual resurrection, born again experience, and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Old things have passed away, behold, all things become new. It is by the faith. The faith causes obedience, Acts 6 7. A great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. I want to include that to show that I'm not picking on Jewish people at all. I'm not picking on anybody. This is for everybody. This message is for Jew and Gentile. And this shows very clearly that in the first century, a company of priests were obedient to the faith. But let's look at those last four words. Obedient to the faith. Christ, guys. Remember I talked a little bit ago about obedience. Faith causes obedience. Christ is the author of salvation to all who obey them. Or obey him, rather. Let me put it, let me say that again. You know, if I edited my sermons, that would be a good place to edit. But, tripping over my tongue and it's okay. Christ is the author of salvation to all who obey him. Hebrews 5.9 And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all that obey him. James 2.17 shows us that faith without works is dead. Being alone. Why is that? Why is faith without works dead? But we're not saved by works, brother. We're saved by grace through faith. How can you, I don't understand, James. I'm going to explain it to you right now. James 2.26 says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So you have a spirit, or you have a body that has no inner man. You have an outer man without an inner man. It's like having a car without an engine. It's not going anywhere. It's not doing anything. It's just going to sit there like a knot on a log. Listen, faith, what that means is that faith, true faith leads to action. James 2.18, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Titus 2.14, I love this verse. Who gave himself for us, talking about Jesus, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, that means lawlessness, and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous mm -hmm. of good works. Hello, somebody. The born-again experience makes you want to obey God. It makes you want to do the works of God. It makes you want to do the things that God would have you do. You know why? Because repentance is not wanting to sin anymore. So if you don't want to sin anymore, then you're going to want to do things for God. You are going to want to walk the way He wants you to walk. Because sin is just as much not obeying Him in the things He wants you to do as it is in not obeying Him in the things that He doesn't want you to do that you do anyway. Both of those are sin. Okay? We're zealous of good works if we're born again. And we're peculiar. That means we're strange. People look at us and go, why are you doing that? That doesn't make any sense. Well, guess what? When it comes to God, when it comes to the will of the Lord, it makes perfect sense. Moving on. The faith causes righteousness. Romans 3.22 Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Philippians 3, 9, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Guys, that's how you get righteous. Faith. In fact, it can be argued, as I said before, faith is a component of righteousness. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. I'm going to take you to 1 Thessalonians Try that again. I'm going to take you to 1 Thessalonians 5 8, and I'm going to take you to Ephesians 6 14. And I want you to see something. Okay? They both have to do with the breastplate of the armor of God. 
First Thessalonians 5 eight says this, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. Keep those two words in mind, faith and love. Ephesians 6 14 says, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. That's referring to the same breastplate guys. Righteousness is comprised of faith and love. I'm just waiting to, to let it sink in. It's a dramatic pause. Righteousness is comprised of faith and love. There's a lot of applications to that when you see something about righteousness. The faith reconciles the sinner to God, which again is why it is so important. Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, just as if I never sinned, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We were at war with God. The natural man is en the natural mind is enmity against God. Enmity. Violence. <sighs> Extreme Extreme oppositional emotion. And yet, through Jesus Christ, we have faith, we have peace with God. And guess what? God calls those that are not his followers his enemies. But through Jesus Christ, we don't have to be enemies of God. We have the Lord inside us, reconciling us to him. By the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we have peace with God. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, once, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Jesus reconciles the sinner to God by his sacrifice and resurrection. Faith gives victory over the world, 1 John 5, 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. In addition, the faith is the body of truth that we believe. We have differences of opinion and understanding on many minor issues, folks. But when it comes to the major issues, the Bible is the word of God. Jesus is the only way to heaven. His blood sacrifice, resurrection, ascension, and return. Add the virgin birth in there. We cannot fight about these things. We cannot sit there and go, oh, it's okay if you don't believe in, in the resurrection. Or it's okay if you don't believe in the virgin birth. No, 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 no. We must all agree on these basic essential doctrines. Because our faith is based on the truth in Christ, it must be defended vigorously. In other words, we must contend for that faith. Men teaching deviations from the truth was why the very book of Jude we can also add Galatians and, and 2 Peter chapter 2 in that mix too. It's the reason Jude and these other books were written. It is by truth that men are saved, 1 Timothy 2, 4. Truth is bonded with mercy, Psalms 85, 10. Mercy and truth are met together. You can't have mercy without truth. They're bonded together. Truth is what makes you free, John 8, 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth must be believed to avoid damnation. 2 Thessalonians 2, 12. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. We are begotten by the word of truth, James 1, 18. Truth is what sanctifies you, John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth in John 16, 13 and in other places. Listen, if you oppose any of the vital doctrines of the faith, how can the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of Truth, be in you? Listen, John 8, 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. The devil didn't stay in the truth. So what of his children?
Listen. Those that are of the truth, Jesus said, they hear his voice. John 18, 7, 1837. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Here we have dichotomy, guys. We have two things that are diametrically opposed. If you hear Christ's voice, you are of the truth. If you do not hear Christ's voice, your father is not God. It's the devil. But let's look at the other side of that again. If you hear the voice of Jesus Christ, if you believe what he has said, if you believe in him and his resurrection, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his virgin birth, we can go on down the line. You believe he is the Lord God in human flesh. You believe all of these vital doctrines of the faith and you believe in the word of the living God. That God preserved it, God wrote, God had it written. He inspired it through the hands of men. And he is the one who preserved it so that you could know the truth. Your father is God. Listen, you are either a child of the devil or you are a child of God. There is no third option. God's truth, ladies and gentlemen, is not negotiable. And I'm going to give you, before we end, I'm going to give you a few duties to this truth. 1 Timothy 3.9 shows that we must hold it in a pure conscience. You cannot mess with it. We must fight for it. Jude 3, our text, 1 Timothy 6.12 and 2 Timothy 4.7, we must fight for it. Hebrews 10.23, we must not waver from it. Hebrews 10.38, we must not draw back from it. And Jude verse 20, we must build ourselves up in it. Let me review those. We must hold it in a pure conscience. We must fight for it. We must not waver from it. We must not draw back from it. And we must build ourselves up in it. The Christian faith has been delivered unto the saints. It cannot be allowed to be changed no matter how, mm -hmm. 1 Timothy 6, 5, men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth might try. Folks, this faith was once for all delivered unto the saints. According to Philip H. Towner, the faith is a theological basis of the worldview and value system within which God's will reigns as truth and from which the truth of God can be communicated to the rest of the world. It will need to be transmitted unsullied, that means unchanged, to successive generations of believers. It must be defended. His, his quote is over. I'm talking now. It must be defended as any prized possession as it is the most prized possession one could have. Eternal life. Escape from eternal punishment. It must be defended. This is your most prized possession. Once for all, Greek hapax completed with everlasting results with no need to be repeated. Christ sacrificed himself once and for all. We see this in Hebrews 7.27. Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. In this, these sins that we have, that all of us have, can be forgiven in Jesus Christ. Folks, there's a lot of poison out there. We need to do our best to keep it away from our loved ones you see somebody, if you see your child or your brother or your system and they're about to drink Ajax, you're going to stop them. They got a big bottle of Mr. Clean and they're trying to drink it like lemonade. You're going to stop them. We need to do the best we can to keep poison, especially spiritual poison, away from our loved ones, which is more and more difficult since we have false doctrines in many churches mixed in with true. True churches do have tares mixed in with wheat. But there are churches that seem to, they, they seem to thrive on it. And they seem to invite it. Listen, 
and, and it's especially too, it's difficult, even more difficult because with a click of a button, there's false doctrine that can appear on your screen at any time. And that's, listen, that's why I'm here. That's why I do what I do. One of the reasons I'm here is to warn the sheep of the wolves to try to look like sheep and to try to keep spiritual poison out of people's minds. The faith, the faith, the faith that is Jesus Christ was once delivered unto the saints. Next week we will conclude John 3 by answering the question from the scripture, who are the saints? Let's pray. Thank you, gracious Heavenly Father. Lord, thank you for the spiritual food that you put before us, Father God. Lord, I thank you for all that are listening, Father God, and I pray that you put this in, in the hands and the ears of anybody that needs to hear it, God. I thank you for it all, God. You're a wonderful God. You're all merciful, Father God. When we come to you, when we worship you in spirit and in truth, God, you are our merciful God who sent your Son Jesus, to die on the cross and defeat death through resurrection so that our sins can be forgiven in him. Thank you for it all, God. In Jesus' holy, precious, mighty, amazing name.